Welcome everyone to our third meeting of the 2019-2020 National Yacht Royal Valley Chapter Year. Uh, tonight it's going to be a busy night for the uh, session. We have uh, a couple of things going on, which I'll explain in a few minutes. Uh, earlier this evening we had a uh, technical session delivered by Joel Primo. So I just want to thank Joel. Uh, he talked about cooling systems, uh, kind of a primer for tonight's uh, presentation. So this is something that Joel's been putting on for us for the last few months, this is a tech session. So I encourage you guys, if you're here an hour early at 4.30, this is when the tech session does start. Uh, so it usually runs for an hour and it's a, a great primer for the uh, presentation for the evening. So thanks again to uh, Joel Primo for putting on the uh, technical session. So in the future, if you look at the uh, communique, you'll see what the uh, following month tech session topic will be about. Uh, tonight's theme is research. And uh, you'll hear from Adam Moons, who's our research promotion chair. He's going to be talking about uh, research promotion and also to recognize the uh, contributors that helped make our research uh, promotion campaign last year a success. Uh, research is very important for the Ottawa Valley chapter. We always get a gold star from society because we do raise a lot of money for research. And that's thanks to uh, individuals and the companies within our uh, chapter. Uh, so this year we have a very aggressive goal and Adam is doing a great job, which we'll be uh, talking about shortly. Uh, also tonight we'll be uh, handing out some CTTC awards. So our RVZ, RVC from Region 2, Dan Redmond's here, along with uh, Jacob, who will be uh, handing out some uh, awards for this evening. And uh, I'd also like to welcome our speaker all the way from uh, Montreal, uh, Frederick uh, Lavalli Tribbiano. Tribbiano? Tribbiano. there, Tribbiano. So thank you for uh, being here tonight. Uh, Frederick's going to be talking about uh, trans, uh, transcritical CO2 refrigeration systems. So with that, I'd like to introduce the uh, BOG and the executive. So if you can, uh, please stand up. Uh, Jacob Huff, Mike Swain, Slyn Baraboo, uh, Peter Shawwood, Joe Delavelle, and our secretary, Ryan Dickinson, our treasurer, Adrian Matani, Adam Moons, our president-elect, uh, Daniel Redman, our past president, and also RBC for CTTC, and myself, Aaron Dawson, your chapter president. You. I'd like to welcome Ryan Dickinson to introduce our guest for this evening. Guests for the evening are Edward Blanco Steger, Eddie Chirado, Connor Brackley, Kai Bryans, Peter Dunlap, Mohammed Habal, Kayla Lurie, Matheson Brown, Ryan McKinnon, Arden Brown, Jim Brown, Brendan Parson, Aditya Patel, Kula Selatore, John Hubbard, Fabian Benoit. Kayleen Trickell, and Chris Wasteblog. Thank you. And we also have a few new members to the uh, Ottawa Valley chapter, so I'd like to invite Andrew Brown up to introduce our new members. We have uh, two new members. Uh, first is Eileen Lee, and the second is Sebastian Laurent. Thank you. This is something that's very important for us that we put on every year. Uh, I myself was hired through the career fair 17 years ago, so it's very important for our chapter. And a lot of members do get hired through this uh, career fair, so I do uh, encourage it. Thank you, so, like you're saying, uh, this year's career fair will be held at Carlton in the Fed Lounge on March 10th from 3 to 6. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Chris Habits or myself. It's in the simple sign up and there should soon be a link in the upcoming events. We're expecting to have a similar turnout to last year, almost 200 students and 15, 17 booths. We still have space for about 10. So if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. And another great event that we put on every, every year is our uh, Ashley Bowling. And uh, I'll ask uh, Michael Callahan to 
talk about this event that takes place next week. Zarin had said the annual Ashtray Bowling Tournament is taking place next Wednesday the 27th. It will be at the Mariva Bowling Lanes. Registration will begin at 6.30 with games starting at 7. It's $40 for a single or $200 for a team of four. So registration is still open until tomorrow. So don't be afraid to volunteer <coughs> people in your office. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, Dan Redman and Jacob Huff to come up and uh, start discussing uh, CTTC and the, uh, the award presentation. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, it is my pleasure and my delight to stand in front of you as the Regional Vice Chair for CTTC. For those of you who don't know, CTTC is the Chapter Technology Transfer Committee and it really is Honestly, it's fundamental to what ASHRAE is and why ASHRAE is. It's the, the mechanism that ASHRAE uses to disseminate information from the people who originally researched the HVAC in our industry through to today, uh, driving innovation, helping us learn from other people's successes and from other people's mistakes. Now, the ASHRAE Technology Awards every year, the society, the region, and the chapters, they go through the process of running a technology award competition. And it starts with submitting at the chapter level a project that is truly innovative in the application of HVAC and our technology. And it is evaluated for innovative building design, occupant comfort, indoor air quality, energy conservation, and it is also evaluated against ASHRAE standards. And it has to be a real building that works. A real building that you already have one year of operational data to prove that your great idea was more than just an idea. So starting with the chapter level competition, I would like to call upon Daniel Wa to come to the front of the stage to present his project submitted last year. Now the project was the Giant Tiger and this is for the first place prize in the chapter competition for the 2018-2019 Society Year. So we should try and get a picture over here though so we don't have the podium. <laughs> So a neat thing about the technology awards, I mentioned that we have a, uh, a chapter competition and a regional competition. So what happens is if you win at the chapter competition, you have the opportunity to submit at the regional competition. If you win at the regional competition, you then have the opportunity to submit at the society level competition and have your project reviewed against all the other projects submitted worldwide. So I would now like to take this opportunity to award Daniel Wah for achieving first place in the new commercial building category in all of Region 2. Now what is truly outstanding about this is Ashbury Region 2 is the only all-Canadian chapter that comprises all ASHRAE members in Canada, east of Winnipeg. So Daniel's project was the best project submitted in all of Eastern Canada for the new commercial building category. So I please join me in congratulating Daniel. And I encourage everybody to consider submitting an ASHRAE Technology Award. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, and congratulations to Daniel. It's uh, great to see our members being recognized at our chapter and also through the region. So congratulations again. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Adam Moons, our Research Promotion Chair, to come up and talk about our Research Promotion Campaign and talk about research.
Thanks, Aaron. I apologize. Uh, slight uh, technical difficulties. I had a couple other slides that I was going to be showing, but I won't be doing that. Um, you're going to see a lot of names listed here, um, major donor awards, uh, honor roll um, per, uh, recipients, and uh, some reasons to be involved in ASHRAE research. <coughs> Excuse me. It's uh, really it's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of ASHRAE and uh, an honor to be the research promotions chair for this year, uh, to be president-elect, to be working with such a fan, fine team and uh, a great family here in ASHRAE. Um, I appreciate everybody and everything that they do to help raise monies for ASHRAE. I'm going to run off a, a very brief list of reasons that you should be investing in ASHRAE. <coughs> Excuse me. Continuation of studies impacting our industry. Development of new research, standards, guidelines, software, all these things that benefit our quality of life and our business in general. Uh, recognition, the chapter and society level, just being uh, having people aware of who you are and what you're doing to help further our studies. Uh, mentioned in our capital communique, uh, mentioned in the ASHRAE journal, depending on your level of contribution. Uh, mentioned at the annual and winter meetings, commemorative coins, which we're going to be getting to shortly. And most importantly, every dollar that you contribute stays in Canada. So all of the ASHRAE money that you are putting forward stays in Canada fourfold. Um, so you're going to be seeing a lot of the benefits. At present, at present there's almost 1.2 million in ASHRAE research dollars in operation in Canada. In Region 2 specifically, $900,000. Uh, and this includes three all allocations to Carleton projects, as well as projects at the NRC. Uh, these projects and the work done by ASHRAE at large continue to be what builds the work that we do and by extension the careers that we have. To date we've achieved over $12,000 of the 37, almost $37,000 that we need for our chapter. Um, we have a particularly high mandate uh, and it's something that thanks to the works that uh, Aaron and Dan have done, uh, apparently I have to continue down that train. But for the years previous, everybody that, that has worked uh, for ASHRAE Research Promotions in Ottawa Valley specifically has uh, done an exemplary job. And uh, it's something that we should be very proud of as a chapter and uh, something that we have to strive towards building on in the future. Um, yeah, so $12,000 so far this year, uh, thanks in part to um, a donation from the ASHRAE Ottawa Valley Chapter, in addition to uh, Ainsworth and Walmart who uh, have donated tickets, and, um, and a select few individuals who have started their donation process. Uh, this month we have tickets from Long Hill, uh, two tickets for Sens Blue Jackets, and they're still available, so if I haven't already seen you, you come find me or one of the other members of the board and we'll be happy to take your money and, um, and put it towards a really good cause. Um, and please know we're going to be going through a, a series of award presentations. Um, it's not going to be inclusive. It doesn't have all of the honor roll um, donors included. It's, uh, it is all just the major donor awards. Uh, so please take note of every, everybody that's up here and, and recognize the value of the work that they're doing because it really does further your position in this industry and uh, your hope for a, better, uh, for a better future. And most importantly, I really do want to uh, congratulate Ainsworth. They're not going to be getting an award from us tonight um, because it's too big an award. We couldn't fit it into the room. So uh, they, uh, they're a Golden Circle Award winner. Uh, which means they made a contribution of over ten thousand uh, dollars last year to the R uh, the RP campaign. So um, I just actually want to thank Ainsworth first and foremost for that. <laughs> and, um, I will set about introducing the um, all the major donor recognition awards. And if there's a representative from the companies, uh, I would invite you to come forward and uh, and accept your token. So uh, we'll start with the uh, bronze 
awards. Uh, first one is going to be for Mastron. Is there any uh, a representative from Mastron here? <laughs> okay. Uh, engineered air. CNS heating. Don't come all at once. <laughs> Take your time. Uh, parts and refrigeration. Bueller. <laughs> Thank you so much for your donation. Modern Niagara. Walmart ventilation. The Mechanical Contractors Association. Total HVAC. Good Key Weed Mark and Associates. Victolic. Hydro Ottawa. This is really anticlimactic. <laughs> and Long Hill Energy. the Ashray Ottawa Valley Chapter. I really want to thank you all for your contributions, for your hard work and your dedication. Um, it means a great deal to our industry that you put the monies that you do forward. And I hope that you see the value in what you're doing and, and what it gives you in your day-to-day -day life. Um, again, Ashray has given a lot of us a career, uh, not just a job. So. Um, if you have any questions at all about research promotions or ways to contribute, I am happy to help and you're going to be hearing from myself and, and our team uh, to be looking forward to more contributions over the year ahead. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, the money we do raise within ASHRAE, and it's not just money you do uh, donate for research, it's money that we do raise for golf tournaments and additional proceeds through seminars. That money does go into research uh, in the form of scholarships, uh, endowments. Uh, and one recently uh, that we created, uh, Adam talked about last month, was our, our YA endowment, so our young engineers in ASHRAE. So we're investing in our younger membership, uh, so that's members that are 35 and younger. And this endowment essentially is going to pay for our leadership weekend, which is something that we invest into our, the younger generation to learn leadership skills within the uh, Ashray society. So the money we do raise goes to, uh, definitely goes to a really good cause. Uh, tonight we do have a table talk from LMP, so I'd like to ask uh, Frederick to come up and talk about his table talk. Yes, thank you very much. So I'm Frederick David Miedo, I'm happy I'll be presenting CO2 a little what we do. We are part of a STEM LMP, we have a tabletop and we were a manufacturer of uh, refrigeration systems. We specialize with CO2 systems. This we help uh, the contractor, whoever the customer is, to start from the ground up, the design the whole project, do all the line sizing, all the installation, to make sure we respect all the codes of the local area. Good. Thank you very much. still want to buy tickets for the RP drop, go see Adam during dinner service.
Thank you. Don't 
a little bit of a regulation for a refrigerant. What's happening in the, in the past, what's happening in the future. We'll talk about, explain a little bit the French radial CO2, what's special about it, what's different compared to standard refrigerant. Talk about energy efficiency, different type of system. And if we have time, we'll talk about, about the, the installation, commercial RDs with CO2. So, regulations. What's happening? Since uh, there's a lot of uh, new regulation happening with the, the Montreal Protocol, they are phasing out certain refrigerant. That's and this, the Montreal Protocol. Basically, there's a lot of phase out since 1998, and then the one reason, the first reason was for the ozone depletion potential of the refrigerant that was attacking the ozone. So basically, we're making a hole in our atmosphere. So. And now, since all of those are banned, now they're mo focusing mostly on the GWP, which is the global warming potential. I have an example of explaining what's global warming potential and how can we compare refrigerant to cars. So here's a quick phase-out schedule of what's happening. So basically, that's, you can find this uh, in the Gazette of a... Uh, there's a website at the bottom of the presentation. We can show it later. But I did a quick review of all of this, basically right here. For if you have, depending on the type of system that you have, there's different GWP that you're allowed as your refrigerant for new installation. So if you talk about a standalone system for up until you have until 2022 to use a refrigerant that has a higher GWP than 1,400. Yeah, and so if you talk about the, for residential in 2025, the GWP goes lower. 150, so which makes there's not a lot of refrigerant that are available at this WP at the moment. So if you start look for a bigger system, let's say for a centralized system for a supermarket, starting 2022, they limit at the 2,200 WP, and the reason was because of the they wanted to have R407 A and all A C F, all of them still available for the supermarkets. So if you look for chillers, 2025, you have a 750 GWP. And these are the phase out that we know of. What's going to be the next step? It's not very clear in the regulation Canada. They're going to do more phase out coming in. So what's happening? Here's a quick chart of basically all the refrigerants you're allowed to use today. Basically, you have a 404 right here, 134. So if you look at the 404, it's around 4,000. 4,000 GWP. So what's happening, those are being banned, and then replacing those refrigerant, or new refrigerant, like the 448A, 449A, these are all refrigerant that they're going to be still acceptable in 2020, but when will be the next phase out? You know, you never know. It's, it's, coming, it's going to be coming in the next maybe five or ten years. Same thing with 134A, you create a new refrigerant that's a blend, for, uh, that has the same properties, let's say for uh, R513A, and that's always a new blend of refrigerant and they're getting more and more expensive. So if you look at the, the list of refrigerant that we have, if you want to go, you don't want to have like to change your system every five years or everything. So if you go with the natural refrigerant, that are totally on the left that has a GWP of one or two, you have uh, ammonia, you have propane and you have CO2. Propane with, propane with ammonia is toxic. Propane is flammable. And there's a lot of regulation for those. Then you have one of the CO2. The only thing is the higher pressure than CO2. But it's a class A1 in my ash rate, which is non-flammable, non-toxic refrigerant. Basically, it's similar to the refrigerant you're reuse of using now nowadays. So here's a quick uh, comparison of GWP compared to cars, because we've talked about GWP, CO2, what, what it is to compare to something we're used to, we see every day. So an average supermarket have about, has about 4,000 pounds of refrigerant in it. That's according to EPA. And average leak rate for a system is about 20, 25%. So that's always according to EPA based on data that they have. So, and the average, car emits 4.6 metric ton of CO2, which is 10,141 pounds of CO2 per year. That's based on 20,000 kilometers 
per year. So to compare this, let's say, to a return that's bad today, or 12. So the, the leak rate of that normal, like, supermarket has 400,000 pounds is the equivalent of having 1,075 cars traveling each of them 20,000 miles, 20,000 20, kilometers per year for that single store. So if you compare with the, another refrigerant, let's say uh, R404, that today is still acceptable until 2020, the, the leak rate would be for the same amount of CO2 in the atmosphere as 385 cars. 407, that is a refrigerant that's acceptable, it's about 208 cars. If you compare, so you can imagine if you had 208 cars traveling just by the refrigerant system, but if you switch to CO2, since your GWP is 1, basically it's the equivalent of having, your leak rate is the equivalent of having 0 0.098 cars traveling for a year. So it gives you an idea of what's the emission of a refrigerant system for, that's for supermarkets. If you go with the industrial, Sometimes you have a system that has way more than 4,000 pounds. So let's talk about transmittal CO2. What's particular with it is the critical point of the CO2 is 87 degree Fahrenheit. And what happened is, usually when we have designed the system, we design for air cooling. So most, but most of the time, but in this area, we get temperature that are way above 87 degree Fahrenheit. So what happens when you go above that critical point is you have what we call the transcritical zone, which I'm going to show you in the pH diagram a little bit later. So you have a, basically that's where you have your liquid and gas. So when you raise the temperature and the pressure, then you get in that super critical phase, which is a foggy gas. It has very special properties that doesn't change phase, and it has when it's hot, it has the same properties as gas. When it gets cold, it has similar properties as liquid but it still has to look like a gas. So you have a GWP that's one, you have operate, operation that are higher. Normally a standard refrigerant would work with PS, uh, around 400 PSI maximum. With CO2, the low pressure, normally we rate it at 600 PSI. And whenever we talk about the high pressure, it's up to 1,600 PSI. That's normal operation. So when you have CO2, there's another particularity. You need to have two stages. When you have low temperature, you need to have a medium stage that will take the gas, which I'm going to show you in the, a little later. Good. So that's your standard transcranial system. Basically, if we start, then your medium temperature compressors. Normally, you would discharge in what we call the gas cooler. Then your gas will come down. And what's different between a standard refrigerant and CO2 are those two valves right here, the throttle valve and the flash gas bypass valve, which I'm going to show you in the pH diagram a little later, what they do exactly. So the throttle valve will separate your high pressure and your low pressure. So all of your liquid lines, everything, that's all on the low pressure side. You have your expansion valves, your evaporators, and here you have your low temperature compressor that will discharge in the suction of your medium temperature compressor. So if you go in that cage diagram, which normally, when we're with standard refrigerant, you would be inside the, uh, I don't remember the name of it, the gas liquid phase. Now with CO2, when it's hot outside, we go into that transcritical phase above the clock right here. So what happens is you have your medium temperature compressors that does this work, you have your gas cooler, and then from point 0.4 to point 0.7, that's where you have the throttle valve. So what happens when you have a high pressure, cool gas, and you reduce the pressure? You have a part that's liquid and a part that's gas. So you end up at that point right here. So you have, basically you want to, you want to separate the liquid and send only liquid to your expansion valves. And the flash gas bypass right here would take all the gas and put it back in your medium temperature compressors. And then you have your evaporators, the expansion valve your evaporators. So what your, your evaporators are seeing is basically subcooled liquid all the time, and there's no gas. So basically, I'll show you the, basically that's taking all the gas out of the tank. So that's why we, the reservoir, we call it the flash tank. So here's a quick uh, idea 
about what is the, what's the operation range of CO2 on your suction side. So if you have what we call medium temperature would be from minus 4 degrees Celsius, degree Fahrenheit, all the way up to plus 60. But you have to take into consideration what is your design pressure, what do you need to do. Because normally the standard equipment are rated around 600 PSI. So if you're at 600 PSI, you cannot work way higher than plus 20 degree Fahrenheit. If you want to go at those higher temperature, you need to work with higher pressures. So for the low temperature, when we talk about low, we can go all the way down to minus 58 and all the way up to plus 5 degree Fahrenheit. One of the reasons why we cannot go lower than 50, minus 58 is because you get in that uh, triple point zone where you have, can have liquid, gas, and solid at the same time. So you don't want to work below this. And these are based on the, the compressor operating range that we have. So here's giving you an idea of what's happening on the medium temperature side on your what we call the gas cooler or commonly called the, the condenser. So basically, similar to a standard refrigerant, when it gets hot outside, the pressure rises to be able to cool your gas before it comes back to get a good amount of liquid to your expansion valve. So what happens at 60 degree Fahrenheit, your system with the throw valve is able to reduce the pressure and work in subcritical mode. So you get more energy efficiency from your system. So in subcritical mode, we're working around 852 PSI. But as soon as the temperature rises, your pressure raises, and then you get in that transcritical phase. And one of the advantages of using transcritical is since you do not condense, you don't have any elasticity. It's all sensible heat, so your temperature goes down. So basically, when you're condensing, you need at least 10 degree Fahrenheit between your air and the temperature you're condensing at to have a good temperature difference. But when in transcritical, usually the typical way of sizing equipment is finding the difference between the air coming in and the gas coming out of the gas cooler, so which reduces the size of your equipment most of the time for a similar product. So when we go with those higher temperature design, normally if you have many hours working on those operations, we would recommend using another technology let's say only, not only air cool, but using antibiotic or other systems to reduce the pressure and gain more efficiency. I'm going to show you a little bit later about the peak energy consumption of CO2. So you see, here's your condition basically in a not too cold climate. So you have a good amount of liquid, let's say about 70% liquid and 25% that's flash gas. So the higher the temperature, the less liquid you have and you're going in your flash gas, flash tank, so you have more gas coming back directly to your compressors. So the, the hotter it is, the less liquid your system produces. So that's why we need to keep those pressure lower to gain more efficiency, to have effective uh, refrigerant movement. So another thing that's particular with CO2 is not all your gas goes through your evaporator. So what happens when you have a lot of flash gas is you have that uh, gas that's basically saturated gas. So if you reduce the pressure, you have very, very low superheat or no superheat. So what happens when you have, let's say, climates like here, you have very warm weather and cold weather. So you need to ensure that you get a certain amount of superheat at your compressor all the time. And ways of doing this, there's different ways of doing it. It's either you need to inject hot gas directly in the suction to make sure you yeah, maintain a certain amount of superheat or you can have a different heat exchanger like you can see here this is the heat exchanger taking the gas so you have that superheated gas coming from your low temp compressors that's that very low superheat coming from your evaporators and then you have that saturated gas coming from your flash tank so to control that superheat you can have heat exchanger directly before your compressor using the return of your gas cooler so you're basically subcooling your CO2 systems and protecting your compressor at the same time. So you're helping the whole system. So let's talk about heat reclaim. A lot of people talk about heat reclaim with CO2. What's particular about it? It's a little bit the same, similar thing with the gas cooler. Since you're not condensing, you don't have any phase change, you have a lot of the capacity that is above 110 degree Fahrenheit. That's your typical pH diagram when it's like around 90 degree Fahrenheit outdoor. So all the capacity, normally you would have only a 
small part of this superheating, and then you would be condensing with a standard refrigerant. But with this one, you can use all of the, almost all, 90% of the capacity as disagreeing before going out to gas cooler. So you get more energy efficiency from your system by doing this way. Yeah, if you have any questions, don't hesitate, just like, raise your hand. We can have some interaction in fact going too fast or. Another thing that's particular with CO2 is since you're reducing that pressure in your flash lane, so the liquid in your flash lane is around 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So normally your equipment would be in a mechanical room. Your mechanical room normally is, let's say, at 70 Fahrenheit or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So if your system stops, that means there's heat that will go inside your flash tank, even if it's isolated. And if you put heat inside that liquid, the liquid starts boiling and raise the pressure. So you, normally you don't want to design your whole equipment for those higher pressure. So one way of doing it that we get, uh, there is is you use a small condensing unit, basically cool down that liquid in case of an emergency. Instead of letting that rate, pressure raise and open up the relief, get a small unit that can have a lack of generator, powering it, just keep that pressure in that receiver a little lower so you can keep your all your CO2 in your tank. So whenever your system is ready to restart, everything's in place, you don't need to talk to all the technician, everything's ready to go. Talk about energy efficiency. With CO2, there's depending on the climate and uh, where you're installing your equipment, you can look at different things. There's the different technology that people uh, has been developed throughout the years. There's the parallel compressors, mechanical cooling, dehumidification, and the ejector technology. Which I'm going to go quick overview about all of those and then do a little round up. So basically, parallel compressor. Like you saw earlier, the flash gas bypass that usually reducing the pressure to go into your medium temperature compressors. But with, by using parallel compressor, you're using the gas directly from that receiver. Instead of reducing the pressure, you have a dedicated compressor taking gas from your receiver and bringing it up directly to your, the gas cooler. So here's a quick, that's your standard system. So when you have that flash gap right here that reduces the pressure, put in the medium temperature compressor. When you have parallel compressors, basically you're adding the compressor that's taking directly gas from that flash tank. So that compressor can be working with a suction of plus 40 degree Fahrenheit, while those compressors are working at plus 20. So you have a gain of efficiency and when it's warm outside. So basically, this is your pH diagram. So you have your compressors, gas cooler, throttle valve. So instead of reducing the pressure here, you take the pressure right here. So working at, at uh, higher suction, so you gain yet more energy efficiency. So mechanical subcooling is something we, you can do with a system that you can subcool your CO2 system with a large CO2 system working with higher suction and pressure. Or you can subcool it using another refrigerant that would be more efficient, you can use propane, ammonia, or whatever refrigerant you want, basically. And what's doing, basically, when you have your standard system using air cool, when you subcool that line, what happens is you move the point 0.4 and point 0.7 to the left, so you have more liquid going to your, in your flash tank. So you have basically no flash gas, or a very small amount of flash gas compared to the amount of liquid you're producing. So when you have subcooling, normally you do not need any parallel compressors, you don't need to add any other components to your standard CO2 system. So the ejectors, that's something personal with CO2 basically. When you have the, it's taking advantage of what we call a throttle valve. Basically that will be replacing the throttle valve and taking more gas from your medium temperature suction and putting it back into your receiver. I'm going to show you a little graph a little later. Right. Your standard system, that's when you add the pilot compressors. Basically, the, your ejector would go, would replace, would replace the throttle valve, and connect with taking gas from your medium temperature compressor 
and putting it back in the flashlight using that pressure difference right here. So it's basically using a, <coughs> there's like a siphon effect. So it's acting basically as a small compressor, just raising some pressure, it's putting more gas in those more efficient compressors that are power compressors. So there's basically the same gauge diagram as the propeller, and then you have taking gas from point one, putting it at point sixteen, so basically higher suction, more efficiency to be able to use more of that CO2 and a more efficient compressor. So this is a quick, uh, basically the peak energy consumption of those compressors. That would be your design condition where, let's say for, I use a design condition at 95 degree ambient, which is, it's a very, very hot summer day. So if you have an evaporator temperature of about the plus 20, Capacity of uh, 600,000 BTU. So if you have a standard transmitter oil system, you, have, you need about 105 kilowatt at a dose condition to make your system work, to make this capacity. What happens if you have a power compressor at this temperature? You have about you need 88 kilowatt instead of 108. So basically, you gain more efficiency <coughs> in this condition. So if you compare it all the way with the 404, 404 we need about 92 kilowatt. So if you look only at the peak, you, it looks like the C2 is um, the disadvantage. But then if you look at the different technologies, then you can get more efficient in those peak climate. So if you look at the, the average energy efficiency for the whole year, basically, with, even if you those when it's hot outside, since we're able to take advantage of and use Toronto, I don't remember what yet, Toronto as a standard. So you see in the whole year, you would consume with the standard transferal system, you consume about 90% of what a 404 system would consume because you're able to take advantage of those lower pressure and more energy efficiency of your system. So, and then if you compare the transferal with other technologies for Toronto, you get, you have a certain amount of, gain of energy efficiency, but you don't gain as much as when it's on those very warm climates. So let's say if you had the same system installed, let's say, in Texas, then it would be very interesting to have product compressor to our ejectors more energy efficient because you have those warm climate most of throughout the year. But in Toronto, sometimes the energy efficiency might be 3 or 4%. So sometimes the return on investment to add those technologies to the system might be very long for a Canadian climate compared to other climates, more southern climates. So if you compare the same system, but using a lower temperature, let's say we use a minus 20 refinery, the C2 gets even more advantages compared to 404. So you went from 90% of the energy compared to 404 to 86% using a little temperature. So maintenance installation, basically just giving you a quick uh, outline of what normally the piping looks like, and normally for a system with rate at 600 psi or 650, depending on the project, we have a type L. You can use up to 58. If you go with a type K, you can go up to inch and one. And in Canada, for the installation, you have to be very careful because we're in the country. We the installer need to have CRNs for all the fittings, which is something that's only required in Canada. And sometimes you can be, you have to make sure you have the right certification for all your components on all your system. So all the line needs to be insulated, even your liquid lines, because since your liquid is subcooled going through your expansion valve, if you don't isolate that, you might create some flash gas or it might create some. Uh, condensation on your liquid lines. <laughs> so on the high pressure side, what's happening with all the Canadian uh, installers need to work with the ASME codes. So on the high pressure, you need, what we recommend usually is using stainless steel, schedule 10, 40 or 80, based on the calculation of what the result comes out and depending on the size. Okay, I have a, so, Compared to, let's say, 404, normally your rule of thumb of the your line size would be about half the size. Let's say if you have two inch line up for your suction, 
where you feel CO2 would be one inch. So just a rule of thumb for in general. And normally the manufacturer will work with whoever the product you, whatever the product you have to make sure you have the right line size to ensure proper oil return and not have too much pressure drop in your line to make sure your system runs properly. So here's a quick uh, fill installation <coughs> kind of guideline that we put it, put together showing you where you can use what type of uh, material. These are all based on ASME, uh, ASME calculation because that's what is required in Canada. So type L, half inch, type K, inch and one, for your suction liquid. And then if you go higher, there's some material you can use uh, either stainless steel or there's a new, uh, it's called copper iron, which there's two manufacturers that produce them at the moment that we can use for the those lower pressure. If you look at the certification on the piping, they have UL certification, but UL is not recognized in Canada uh, for the installation, which is always confusing that you have a piping saying, say, <coughs> UL or 700 PSI, but then your know, is only 300 PSI. So, that's so why you have to be very careful where you're installing your system, making sure you have the right piping, the right certification for the product. And this we can, there's always a lot of people helping, a manufacturer help you with this all the selection to make sure your product gets accepted, no problem. So, biography. Good. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes. The the market for CO two right now is mostly in supermarket refrigeration, those kinds of places. Uh, I know it's being investigated for a lot of hockey rings as well. I know the arenas are being they're using it. Like, what's the progression until we start seeing it in HVAC applications? There's well, the market I would say, if you go back three years, it was mostly in supermarket, like you said. Now what we're seeing is the industrial is very interested about CO2. And one of the reasons is because of, you want to get, basically we're, CO2 is replacing ammonia in most of some projects. Because uh, of all, not all tragedies, but like some of the tragedies with that happen with ammonia kind of scare people away. And all the regulation that need to be taken with ammonia. So that's why going with CO2 for industrial project, that's big interest. Ice rink, that's the thing, there's a patent on ice cream in Canada, so for CO2. So there's very little amount of people that can work with this. So for HVAC, we're, there's manufacturers that are working on using CO2 in the HVAC, but it's all about finding the right components and having those higher pressure. Because I, I saw it in the, I showed in the graph earlier, when you're at around 40 degree Fahrenheit suction, which is usually your HVAC suction pressure, you need to have, you have a pressure, you're, you have a running pressure around 600 psi. So your evaporator needs to be rated at at least like 8 or 900 psi to make sure you're in that operating range. So having those coil and working with the parent or manufacturers to have them install the right components is something possible. Where there's been projects where we work on with gap the the whole refrigeration of the supermarket, and we do the uh, air conditioning at the same time. So everything is linked together. So we're using the air conditioning compressor to subcool your refrigeration compressor. So your AC is working with your refrigeration to gain the maximum efficiency of the whole system. And it's all about, like I said, it's always finding the right components and what's basically slowing down a little bit is because there's no standard components. So every hair and nerves has to be custom made for this project with custom made coils. That's kind of one of the reasons why it's not going there yet. But there's more and more manufacturers that are being aware of the benefit of CO2 and how it can be designed and worked with. But is, is there a part where like, we're looking at say 10 years, 20 years, or are you predicting this? Because one of the things that's frustrating for you know, HVAC industries is is the, the first couple of slides you showed with all the refrigerants. Yeah. I mean, it seems that every three four years, Dow and, and DuPont come up with new refrigerants. Yeah. And we're all going, yeah, okay, let's scrap all the refrigerants we've been using before, then we have new refrigerants to use, 
and then we just follow because that's, they managed to convince us that, that that's the big thing we need to do. And I think, you know, first thing, we, the best bridging we had was was bridging like three, four generations ago. The, the new ones are all crappier than the ones we had before. So um, it seems to me that that eventually we're going to get to a point where CO two is 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 viable because owners are going to be tired of changing every four or five years the refrigerant as the refrigerants get and not knowing what's going to get taken out. So like is is there is there a, a, a commercial viability where CO two is going to be in buildings soon? Like, Ten years, twenty years, or like what 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 should happen for CO two to be wiping out refrigerants currently used without being there there are like I said there's one factor that are working to integrate CO2 with HVAC. When is it going to be, let's say, the same cost as what you have today with, let's say, 134A? It will be hard because one of the reasons with CO2 that most of the system are using electronic valves. So usually for HVAC, I don't think, maybe you can correct me, but I don't think you have, you have mostly like mechanical valves. So that removes a lot of the costs doing mechanical compared to electronic. And all the valve with CO2 is all electronic. The, the profile that we, I showed, the flash gas, that's one thing. There's, I know there was some manufacturer working on a mechanical valve that could reduce the cost of the system. When it's going to come out, this, we don't know. They, we know they're working on it. And the other thing, if you look at the pressure, so if you have higher pressure, that means you have, you have thicker materials to be able to withstand the pressure. So I have thicker materials, which is more cost, but it's all about after that it's getting the volume up. It's, it, there's, and if you look at the regulation in Canada, you, you're allowed to use CO2 with air handling units, there's no problem. In the US, CO2 is not accepted at the moment in air, air conditioning uh, systems. And that's all about like lobbying and being like, on those, the EPA getting accepted. We look into it, there's a file that I, a lot of documents you need to fill out to be able to use it, and it's all about doing it and being like actively prepared for it. So that's why we're working on it, it's trying to get the market there, and the more there will, the more unit that will be in there, the cheaper the cost will be. Because if you look at a system, the super super system for supermarket, you go back five years, five or six years ago, the same system now today is about 30% cheaper than it was five years ago. So that's a big progression on the cost because there's more manufacturer coming in. There's a lot of manufacturer from Europe because CO2 has been very, very popular in Europe. Now all of those technology are coming here and bringing down the cost to uh, the, the systems. Yes. Uh, are there, I guess, scaling issues with getting it smaller? For like, I'm thinking, like, why aren't we like, storing CO2 in refrigerators and window air conditioning, like window trigger, and air conditioning, and stuff like that. Yeah, well, what's been uh, happening with uh, those smaller units that you talk about, stuff like thing? Yeah. Let's say uh, for inside the store, usually those, in those conditions, CO2 is not on the advantage, because you saw in the graph, your peak kilowatt is higher when it's warm. So normally inside your store, it's always warm. If you don't take advantage energy on the energy efficiency, that's where CO2 would be disadvantages on a smaller unit indoor. Because you can't use those warm uh, cold color uh, temperature. So basically what's happening a lot is people are pushing with, uh, I know there's a lot of propane coming in, then you have to be careful with the, the regulation. There's a lot of the amount of propane you're allowed to use and what the type of location you're using. Because even if it's small, it's self-contained, still regulated by the CSA E52 code. So if you look at your E52 code, you have to make sure wherever you're selling it, you have, you're allowed to do it. So I don't see it on the, those type of units, but for a condensing unit where you could put it at an outdoor condensing unit, then you could get the energy efficiency gain from it. And there's an incentive to, from different governments, of using C2 for those small condensing units. But using the condensing unit with the heat reclaim, all of that, comparing to, it's all about like comparing the cost. Yes. So it's not so much about scaling, it's just more about the environment? Yes, yeah, where it's, well, 
and then you want to have something that's energy efficient at the same time. Yes. Well, you mentioned there's no issues with flammability or toxicity. Are there any concerns with oxygen displacement? There, there are some on the look at the ash layer, the B52. There are some uh, amount of CO2 you're allowed to have in the air to be like <coughs> and then there's really normally in the mechanical room where you would have let's say a small room where you could have a leak of CO2, you need to have a CO2 detector in there. Which is the same thing as any refrigerant actually. So and look at the concentration of CO2 compared to let's say uh, another refrigerant, normally the concentration can be higher without being dangerous for for you. So but yeah if there's small confined room with a possible leak, then you need to make the precaution of what's happening. So there's so it's the same regulation as any other refrigerant. And on that note are the system volumes comparable? The volume? Like with the volume of refrigerant? Yeah it's, it's very similar. It would be a little bit smaller because all your liquid lines such and are smaller. So you have a little bit smaller charge. But normally the cost of the refrigerant itself, let's say you look at CO2, would be about $2 a pound. And if you look at R407, I don't know exactly how much it is, but I know it's about a minimum 10 times that price. So sometimes people are, you don't really look at the charge of CO2, it's more for the incentive. With, uh, with the higher pressures, do you, do you see like greater leakage rates? Or? Any issues with uh, reliability? I don't have data on this. I know that EPA has some data on this. We're saying there was higher leakage rate, rate, and one of the reason was because since it's CO2, it's a natural refrigerant, the contractor are allowed to vent it out. So if you have to do maintenance, you close that system and you vent it out because it's natural. So the it brings up the, the leakage rate to a higher, that's for sure. It's cheaper. It, it is cheaper, so, but if you're using standard refrigerant, you're, you're supposed to take it out, put it in a bottle, so that's why maybe one of the places where the highest leak rate could come from. I have one more question actually. Uh, do you think that the compressor technology isn't as mature as it could be, like uh, some of the performances were lower? Is that a limitation of the refrigerant, or do you think the compressor technology could be like further developed to, to reach higher performance? It's mostly about uh, the properties of CO2. I don't think the compressor itself could. Like that, you can always have like other technology ma match together to gain more energy efficiency, like parallel or ejector, or so cooling. But on the compressor itself, I don't think it's going to go bring up that efficiency that much. It's mostly on the system. So, and if you look all about like the, animal, the total animal energy consumption, that's mostly what the customer would be interested in. Or some place I know we have to have a like peak charge rate, so that's when if you need to limit your peak, then you need to design with a, either high storage or some kind of a, using the energy efficient you can get at night to store more coal. There's different way with the controller you can help your system and reduce the peaks. Are, are these like scrolls or? Uh... Uh, there's, on the low tender, there's the scrolls, or ceramic. On the medium tent, it's only thermometric because of the higher pressure. And I know there are some screws that are coming out. And one of the reasons why CO2 is not more popular in industrial applications is because the compressor capacity is too small for certain applications. So they compare, let's say, ammonia, then we need, say, four compressor, and that produce, let's say, 1,000 ton of refrigeration. You know, with CO2, you would need something like 20 compressors. So they're like, okay, maybe not to this scale, but sometimes now there are certain manufacturers are coming out, developing CO2 compressor for bigger capacity, and it's all about the market that will be shifting through this. And what we're, we're being told by manufacturers is that the North American, had, they want bigger compressor, but European, they want smaller compressors. So they're like, where do, do they focus the most? And what's happening with, in Europe is the regulation are much more limiting to the uh, refrigerator you have to use. That's why you see a lot of development over there and the almost mass market with natural refrigerator. And here it's coming up. The US started to go, but now with the EPA they kind of rolled it back. So they're not sure with what regulation is going to go. And now I think it's almost every state are making their own 
regulation on the refrigerant on based on the GWP. So it's kind of a transition phase. So that everybody's kind of following the trend. Look, most of the customers are waiting on, on knowing what's the next regulation. Because they don't want to, some of them, they want to try it, see how it works, to get familiar with it, see if they like the technology, if they see the savings. And so some of them will say, no, I'm not going to take any more investment. You want just looking at today, how much first cost. Um, this is cheaper, that's what I want. So sometimes when it came out long term, that's another story. Yes? Got it very high pressure is there a kind of a safety protocol you have to follow? Or, or a proper PPE that they're doing the maintenance of those equipment? There's the standard, just standard protocol as any refrigerant system. We, we talk about higher pressure, but the whole system is designed for this higher pressure. Because uh, we know that in refrigeration, like 1,600 PSI is high, but if you look on the hydraulic side, you have components rated for 10,000 PSI. So that's one of the things that we're using some of those components that are rated for 10,000 for CO2 that So you're using about 20% of the pressure range of the components. So it's not a problem. And all the piping is designed for this. So we're not using six inch type L piping with CO2 system. That's, that doesn't work. But everything is designed for this. And we know in the field that the, the lower lacks one for very cheap pressure there. When you have an accident with uh, 1,600 pounds, uh, that was. Well, usually you have all you have relief valves. Yeah. Let's say, well, in short, the, yeah. you have all the high pressures off. When we talk about the high pressure with the, the 1,600 psi, that's basically from your compressor to your gas cooler. So basically, you don't have a, that very high pressure going all the way around your store. Unless you have heat reclaim, then you can have those whole pipe here and there, to that, but it's all, it's all stainless. And whatever it's on the low pressure side, let's say for your liquid line, since you, you can have a, you have that subcooled liquid, normally we have everything's pressure back to the receiver. To make sure if there's anything that happens, let's say a technician close the pull valves or forget to purge the system, everything will be pressured back to the receiver to make and the receiver is always protected by relief valves. Okay, and the last question is that uh, we were talking about to protect the flash tank. You have a, uh, a little compressor that cools down. Yeah. Uh, do, does that compressor need to be on emergency power of the building to make sure that if there's loss of power, that have to run to protect the tank? Yes. Yeah, so normally that's what we see. Or another thing you can do if, let's say they don't have an emergency unit, you can have what some people call it a burp valve. So you have the electronic valve, basically just opening, controlling the pressure in the receiver. You lose a small amount of CO2, but you don't lose your whole charge at the moment of the relief. So you just open it up and close, open and close, and control the pressure. Or so we've seen some places where they have a backup generator that would take the whole refrigeration system. So if there's a power outage, the generator starts and it continues producing because the product that they have is so valuable. They don't care. They say they generate us a million dollar, but they have ten million dollar in product. So if they lose power for all of their systems, for them it's cheaper to buy those bigger equipment. Early in the presentation, you mentioned the adiabatic cooling, I guess. Yes. Around the gas cooler is what you normally be yes. doing. Yes. So basically, I know if you're familiar with the adiabatic, basically you have the, the gas cooler, then you have spray water. So we don't have water directly on the coil. Then you use less water than, let's say, an evaporative condenser. So this is a standard design. We, we see it some application in Canada, mostly for certain places where we have some certain amount of limitation on horsepower for the compressors. So by having this, you gain on the energy efficiency of the system, plus you can reduce your, the size of your system. Uh, but like it, down south, we have a product in uh, Texas where you need to have this to be a to have certain energy efficient of the system. Yes. Are mechanics being trained on the maintenance of CO2 systems? Yeah, well, we, we do training. There's a different manufacturer that does training on explaining how it works. And 
usually with every system you have a, like say a like protocol of maintenance, what you have to do out process, like uh, say when you charge the system out, to charge the liquid directly, and yeah, it's very available. If you want more information, I have my card and we have some pamphlets. And if you need for more information for whatever question you have. Good. So I don't know if you want to go to have time for yeah. explain a student input, explain a project that so I'm Stuart Parson, I'm uh, president of Parson Refrigeration. We've actually done two CO2 stores and we were fortunately selected to do the Tana Cisco expansion, which uh, I convinced them to look at CO2 because their, their spec was all ammonia, so uh, it was a bit of a hard fight, but uh, this facility in Ottawa will be their first transcritical CO2 system in North America. So I'm sure many of you know Tannis Trading. They were sold uh, to Cisco a couple of years ago, and they're doing a major expansion.
that's it actually with the grading in, so actually it's now safe to work in. And you can see the duct work is dropped in place, so we have turning veins, and that will, uh, each of those air handlers will throw about 160 feet through the freezer. It's just a the freezer, basically as it looks today, pretty much. We capture the heat from the racks to do the frost protection of the freezer floor. So this is just they're starting to lay out their headers for the uh, for the packs to do all the loops to uh, and each of our little tamper racks we have a uh, CO2 glycol heat exchanger on it to capture the heat. And that's uh, starting to lay the loops out for the frost protection. There's an LMP rock, that, that's one of the low temp ones for the tip. So I don't know, maybe you want to... <laughs> We're not supposed to talk about that at a company. Oh, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> 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 we can talk about it later after. <laughs> so that's one side. I believe this is the, is that the meter? Yeah, temp sure, meter temp. So you can see all the stainless steel discharge or installed. And this... <coughs> These, these boards up here are really what makes it all possible. This is the microtherm system. These are the boards controlling the compressors and the condensers, but each of the evaporator will have a similar board where we measure, we have a pressure transducer and multiple temperature probes on each evaporator coil going back to one of these boards, and it manages superheat temperatures. Um, so you get an idea of like how much control Basically, the whole top section is, wouldn't be needed with a standard grid system. So with, since we're using CO2, we have a lot of electronic valves. We all those control added on as protection, as control for the valve that are existing. So. On this conventional side of the, like we're out of the freezer now, we're into the cooler area, so we've gone sort of more conventional on the evaporator coils. You can see the, that's the compressor in behind. It's actually a panel wall up there now. So this is feeding a number of the medium temperature rooms. They're uh, keep right about bigger coils. Uh, this was uh, taken when somebody said, why do we even need refrigeration? Because that was not <laughs> snowing last week. <laughs> and you can see some of our pipe runs up here. So these are pipe runs coming up to the dock. We had to, our biggest suction line here is uh, engine 5, so we are using the uh, XHP 90 bar because that was the only thing that would pass TSSA. And it's very expensive. But it can be raised. But yes, our, our regular refrigeration mechanics with our raising certificates are raising raised, so that's a huge advantage. We don't need to bring in welders. Because on the high side, we, we're not qualified to run stainless, so we have to bring in uh, uh, specialized welding companies to do it. That is just a picture of the, that will be the loading dock. So they just get a, you're getting a sense for the size of it, and that's it. Just a couple of comments. Your question on CO2 in confined spaces. It's all defined in the B-52 glass or something. <clears throat> if we can, uh, the smaller rooms, we, well, we're gonna sense CO2 in the entire facility, but we're only putting uh, strobes in the smaller rooms because the calculation is you've gotta assume one of the rocks dumps its entire charge into that whatever space it is. So in the freezer with four rocks, it's not an issue. We could dump 6,000 pounds of CO2 in there and would not violate anything. But when you get down to the smaller rooms, we're assuming a 1,500 pound charge uh, in like a 10,000 square foot room, we would violate the 5,000 parts per million, which is the 5,000 parts per million is the eight hour limit. So if you alarm at that, basically you still have eight hours to get out. Was it 
cheaper to build this than, uh, let's say, using the new refrigerant, the 452A? I, I, I don't know if it was available when we started this. Okay. Um, but my sense of new refrigerants is they're not very efficient. And we have 1,050 nominal horsepower in there. And I know Cisco will be comparing us to an ammonia plant, which I, 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 I'll find fascinating because we have the ability, like each of those racks has up to seven or eight compressors on it. So if we don't need them, we shut them off. Where an ammonia plant might be four big screws at 400 horsepower, 300 horsepower, which all they can do is slow them down. So um, a more efficient motor is one that's turned off. So. Yeah, well, on the, on the cost of the system, normally when we, because we're, CO2 is very often compared with a 404 system or 407, but with electronic valves. Because if you, you want to compare apple to apple, so the thing with the electronic valve with CO2 with a you know, electronic valve 407, normally CO2 is about to, between 20 and 30% more expensive on the total cost of this system. Give me an idea. Capital cost. Capital cost, yes. Yeah, yeah. And then you can calculate the return on investment depending on the FDI. Uh, on the leak rate with the refrigerant, you can calculate based on, let's say, if you want to keep your system for 10 years or 25 years, depending on what you're seeing for in the future to, for your, your, the plant itself. And just on the backup issue, somebody had mentioned that. We had originally designed them in, and they came back and they, they have full power enough to drive the entire refrigeration, so they, they took them out. Thank you very much. Future uh, technical seminars. Uh, one thing to mention: that there's no meeting next month. Uh, we will rejoin in January. Uh, it's going to be hopefully a big event. We have Derek Boyce uh, delivering his presidential address. He's our uh, chapter member. He's also a society president. So the meeting in January will be on January 23rd, which is a Thursday. It's not a typical uh, third Tuesday of the month. So uh, look out for the uh, invitation very soon because we want to get an idea of how many people. Uh, so with that said, uh, everybody enjoy the holidays next month, and we'll see you in the new year. Thank you.